Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's good to see you again. This has been uh, an interesting series, I hope, for all of you who have been following it. And uh, tonight, uh, I, we're bringing this series to a close. And we're bringing it to a close by looking at or saying a few things about the last of the four major documents that were produced by the Second Vatican Council. And so I've entitled uh, this presentation Gaudium et Spes, 50 years later, facing the challenge of the new evangelization. And so in this year of faith, we've been looking again at Vatican II. The event, the experience, and the teaching. Now for some people, our efforts have been a first exposure to the Council's teaching and direction. But I hope that for all of us, the time that we have taken together and the reflections and the questions have also been informative. And especially I'm hoping that they have been formative. So it's not just information, but it's also formation. I was uh, reflecting myself on the fact that when I first looked at this document, the Constitution of the Church in the Modern World, I was a seminarian. And so I looked at this and uh, received it like so many other things that I was receiving in the seminary. This was all part of the package, and uh, you learned stuff, and you passed exams, and you did all the kinds of things that students do. But here I am now reading it all 50 years later, and it has a whole other dimension to it because now I'm looking at this from 43 years of experience as a priest, um, almost 10 years as a bishop, and reading the document and getting into some of the things that are found in there all of a sudden took on a new dimension and perspective. And so my hope in doing this series isn't just to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Council, but it was also in the hope that we would find a renewed spirit to go forward with today's challenge, with the present challenge, which is to become disciples and apostles of Christ right now, and to become disciples and apostles of the new evangelization, which I've mentioned now a number of times, and I keep mentioning it because it has a very specific purpose. Why are we even looking at getting into this challenge of the new evangelization? Well, the first reason is because so many of our baptized Catholics have become disaffected. They're not interested anymore. They've walked away. And maybe some of you can probably imagine and think of a number of people that you know 
who have done just that. Remember in the prayer that we produced for the new evangelization, I asked everybody to pray for five people. It's amazing how many have come up to me and said, you know, I'm praying for those five people. And most of the five people that are being prayed for are right in everybody's homes. So there's a, that's one of the first reasons for this new evangelization. But another one is so that we can become motivated to reach out to those around us who do not know Jesus Christ. And if we do that, I'm hoping that this is going to also renew our own community of faith. This is how we become the church, the assembly of God's people, and we become faith-filled followers of Christ. That's by way of introduction as to why we did what we did. Now, what are we looking at tonight? We're looking at the content and the spirit of the pastoral, the words are important, the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world. And for those who are more familiar with this, it's referred to as Gaudium et Spes, by its Latin name. And those two words, Gaudium, or three words, Gaudium et Spes, means joy and hope because those are the opening words of this document. Now, what about this document? Well, it's the last of the 16 documents which make up the content material of the Second Vatican Council, at least in its written form. And the document, the text, provides us with the final version of a document which the bishops and the theologians gathered in Rome worked for a long time and very hard to craft this document and to put it together. And I guess I must have taken a lesson from uh, these guys because they produced the longest of the uh, 16 documents, and somewhere along the line I must have picked up that virus because I've been reminded on numerous occasions that I talk for too long. But I think that's part of being a bishop, I don't know. It's the longest of the documents, but more importantly, I think in some ways, this document was also the most controversial. So that always perks people up, right? Most, most controversial. Now, when you read the document, and if you have the documents of Vatican II, and it's a big, thick book, and so on, and you start reading, you're reading the words. And when you read those words, the words say what the bishops understood and how they understood things at the time, and how they saw the role of the church as the church tried to engage and connect with the modern world of 1965. What the text doesn't say is all that went on in the persons who wrote the text. And when you talk to some of those individuals, they tell unbelievable stories. And they tell you very interesting stories. Uh, I was talking, in Canada, there are three bishops still alive who were present at Vatican II. And one of those is Archbishop Hayes. 
So on occasion, when we're sitting around at lunch uh, and we bring something up, he relates some of the stories. You don't get that when you're reading the text. The other two bishops in Canada, one of them is uh, Bishop Charbonneau, who's 92 years old, and uh, about uh, three months ago, he wrote a little book on what he experienced at Vatican II. And the, the message was that it was best four years of life. <laughs> and the third one is uh, Bishop Derue, who is also in his 90s, and he was of uh, Victoria. Now, the text doesn't tell us how these guys felt and how they worked together. And we don't know, at least when we're reading the text, we don't know who wrote what. But if you do the research, it starts to get interesting if you're an historian. We don't know how the council fathers experienced being there in Rome, the energy and the enthusiasm. And the text doesn't tell us about the conflicts and the controversies which stand behind the final version of this teaching document. When you read about some of those individuals and some of the interactions, it becomes interesting. Now, I say all of this because it's important to grasp the impact of this text if we can find a way to put it in its context. It would be helpful to all of us if we could understand what 50 years ago was meant by the modern world. What was the modern world 50 years ago? And what did the bishops have in mind when they said, this is how the church is supposed to be in the modern world. Well, whatever the modern world was 50 years ago, it sure isn't the modern world now, <laughs> right? Things have changed so much that um, questions would arise and have arisen about, well, what's the relevancy of this document? Is it still valid? Should we bother with this thing that was presented 50 years ago? Why are we wasting our time on something that was written for a world that doesn't exist anymore? Well, 50 years ago, there were some people at the council who didn't want to write this document. And some of them thought that it was already irrelevant. And some thought that it was also a distorted document right from the very beginning. Some bishops criticized the vision and the proposals that we find in this document because they thought that we were getting away from the traditional understanding of the church. And so what was being said was not fitting to the church's mission and to the church's purpose. And so they would have hoped that it had never appeared. Now, what's the most extreme example of what I've just said? Well, we probably, I think, many of us perhaps have heard of Archbishop Lefebvre. Have any of you heard of him? Well, he's the guy that broke away from the church. He's the guy that uh, 
wanted the Latin to stay. He's the one that created a whole different church and ordained some bishops to follow in that tradition. That's the church and the group that had uh, one of the bishops, uh, Bishop Williams, I think, Williamson, who denied the Holocaust, for instance. Remember that created a controversy not so long ago? Well, that group was one of the groups, one of the, or the, 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 uh, the ones who felt that this should never have happened. But on the other hand, there were those who saw what was written in Gaudium et Spes as describing the necessary vision that we needed in order for us to go ahead into the future of the church. They saw in this the authentic way for the church to face the challenge of the new world. They thought that what was being promoted here was the way in which Christ's message would remain the authentic message of salvation and the good news which needs to be proposed and proclaimed in all times and in all circumstances. Now let me give you just a little bit more of this personal background stuff about people who were there. Both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict, they were both there 50 years ago. And John Paul II was there as a bishop. He was a young bishop. And Pope Benedict was there as a young theologian, professor. They both participated at the same council. And they ended up with different views of the council. Two popes, different views, not necessarily opposed, but not necessarily in agreement about the value and the impact, particularly of this last document that was produced. They were very different. Pope John Paul, when he was there as a bishop, he was also there as a philosopher. And he was a philosopher who came out of Poland, a philosopher who had studied contemporary philosophy. And he came to the council with that background. And particularly, he had a very uh, different understanding of what it means to be a human person. He had what in philosophical circles is referred to as a personalistic view of the human being. Pope Benedict, on the other hand, he came from Germany, he came from a very different background, and he was trained in the school of theology which comes from St. Augustine. Now, St. Augustine, he lived in the fourth century, and he had a very different view of what it means to be human. St. Augustine is the one who was very much preoccupied with humanity's sinfulness. If any of you have ever read this, you might recognize the name. St. Augustine wrote a book which is entitled The Confessions of St. Augustine. And what does St. Augustine confess? 
Well, he confesses his sins. And he had a view of humanity as being affected by sinfulness. Well, Pope Benedict comes out of that school. And so for Pope Benedict, being a human being means having to deal with that side of reality, with our sinfulness. And for him, the emphasis is on grace, and the emphasis is on the power of God, and on the reality of the cross, and on the need for forgiveness. All good Catholic stuff. These two popes worked together for 25 years in Rome. Or at least the two persons worked together. One replaced the other. So they're not opposed to each other, but they have a difference in emphasis which would manifest itself in the way pastoral ministry is done. Now, I don't know if Father Eric is here someplace. He's sitting in the back. He has his personality. He has his training. He has his background. And I have mine. I suspect that we're probably not very much on the same wavelength on a lot of things. It's not an opposition. It's a difference. But it does make a difference how you approach your pastoral ministry and how you understand the people that you're dealing with and how you treat them. Well, this difference is still found in the church today. We have some who are optimistic, uh, some who are hopeful, and then there are others who are negative and who are less inclined to buy the vision and the orientation that we find in Gaudium et Spes. I guess uh, another way of putting that is uh, you're always going to have people who see uh, a half bottle of scotch as being either half full or half empty. Now, depending on your perspective, that says a whole lot, doesn't it? And someone told me the other day that if this bottle of scotch is half full, you're going to be probably inclined to share it. But if you think that the bottle of scotch is half empty, uh, you're probably going to keep it someplace and hide it and not share it with too many people because half of it's already gone. <laughs> now, I don't know how that fits into our theological views here, but we do have people who see the church as half full and some who see it as half empty. And when that happens, that changes the way in which you proceed, the way you do things. Gaudium et Spes is a document that sees things optimistically, sees, as it were, the church as half full and therefore having enough there to actually still go out and do something good with it. And so the principle behind Gaudium et Spes, the principle and the foundation upon which this document and teaching is founded, is that we are to be in solidarity with the whole human family. And because we are in solidarity with the whole human family, then we are called on to be in dialogue with the people who make up the world. Do you see that? 
So this underlying principle, the definition and the, or the description of what it means to be human is very important even for us today because it's going to affect the way we understand or we don't understand the task of doing the new evangelization. It's going to affect the way we treat each other in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in our parishes. Again, very practical point by way of example. If I think that everybody around me is bad, if I think that everyone's going to hell in a handbasket, then what am I going to do? I'm going to be criticizing them. I'm going to be calling them names. Or I'm going to withdraw to my secure place, live in a bubble, and um, just become preoccupied with saving my own soul. If, on the other hand, I look around and I see human beings who are struggling, who are trying to find their way, just as I'm trying to find my way, then they become companions. They become someone with whom I can walk and walk the journey of life, with whom I can share my hopes and my dreams, with whom I can speak about my fears and my concerns, and then together experience the grace of salvation. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but what I just described here is the experience of the people of God who were liberated from oppression in Egypt, who ran around the desert for 40 years, and uh, complained and got shaped and formed and became the people of God. And some of them got to the promised land. That's one of the biblical images which stands behind the whole of the Vatican Council. Because the key definition for the church that came out of the Second Vatican Council was that we are the people of God, that we are a pilgrim church, that we are on the way. You still have to deal with the people that are complaining. Moses had his hands full and that hasn't changed. I still have my hands full. But we're still on the way. And we're still on the journey. So today, as we face the challenge of transmitting the faith, of the new evangelization, the motivation for doing this is not to fill our churches the motivation for doing this is because we look around and we see people who are in difficulty. We see people who are experiencing trials and struggles just like we are, our fellow human beings. And because of our desire to be in solidarity with them, we share with them in dialogue that which we believe and that which we hold to be true and sacred and significant. Well, at the time that the council was convened and for the four years that they gathered together, what was going on there? What was the modern world that they were trying to reach? They were trying to reach a world that had undergone some amazing changes. Now, 
Can you picture yourself in 1965? Because most of you were there. Most of you were there, except for this guy. <laughs> so what was happening inside 1965? Well, many things, I suppose. You can probably remember your own experiences, but the world was changing. The world was beginning to go global. It was trying to live at the aftermath and getting over the effects of World War II. People were uh, coping with the impact of the Cold War. Some of you remember Khrushchev banging his shoe on, uh, on a desk at the United Nations. Uh, you remember uh, Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev going at it uh, uh, head to head with the threat of a nuclear war or because of Cuba? That's what was happening. The other thing that was happening was that Europe was no longer the center of the world. And one of the other things that was going on, and maybe we see it better now than we would have back then, is that the process of decolonization was happening. That's when all those countries that were established by European countries, they were telling all the Europeans to go home. And they were becoming independent and not only were they becoming independent, but they were becoming politically active, and they were sometimes giving their, the countries that created them, or at least gave them their existence as they saw it at the time, they were giving them a hard time. Science had become the new solution to every problem and on and on. You can add more stuff. So where was the church? How was the church to face this modern world? In fact, who was the church? Well, the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world was the response. And it's interesting if we zero in just on the opening words to show how things were being adjusted and changed in the church. It begins with a desire to connect with the experience of humanity and to establish a point of contact not condemnation, and that's important. A point of contact and not condemnation. Now that was a major shift in the attitude of the church, in the way the church understood her role in herself, because up to that point, the church, in every council that took place until Vatican II, what they did at the end was they would come up with a whole series of things that they would condemn. Whoever believes such and such, anathema sit. That was the Latin for may he go to hell. <laughs> Essentially, that's what it was. I'm not saying any of those things in this council. This was a pastoral constitution a major shift in attitude, and it indicated the church's desire to want to interact with people. And what was the basis for that interaction? If we are the people of God, then we share something with the people of the world. And what we share between the people of God and the people of the world is that we're all people. That was the point of contact. And so what do we read in the opening words 
of this document. It says this, The joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the men, in my notes I have in brackets people, but the text says men, the joy and the hope, the grief and anguish of the men of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted in any way, are the joy and hope, the grief and the anguish of the followers of Jesus Christ as well. And here's an interesting line. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts the Christian's hearts. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in our hearts. This is the foundation of the church's presence and the church's purpose in the modern world. It's our shared humanity. And of course, when we look at this, we might think this is radically different than you, and yet... It is being consistent with Christ's mission and Christ's ministry. Christ is the anointed one because he is the incarnate one, the one who shares our humanity. This is how the Son of God chose to save us. And this is how Christ remains relevant to human beings yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Christ was born like everyone else was. He lived the same kind of human existence as we do. He shared our pains he shared our sufferings, and like every one of us will, he died. He died. The only difference is, and we say it every time we celebrate Mass, he accepted his death willingly. He wasn't trying to run away from it. He wasn't trying to be somehow in the illusion that maybe we don't have to go there. He actually said to us, it's the only way to get through it. It's to go through it. But what he also brings to us is the resurrection. And it's because of the resurrection, because he rose from the dead, that we can hope for and pray for the world to rise up and to go beyond its failures and its difficulties and its pains and its sufferings. And so the connection between the church and the world, whether it's the modern world of 1965 or whether it's the postmodern world of 2013, what makes the connection between the two is the solidarity which exists between and among all of us as human beings. Well, there's a lot more to be said, but uh, I think I probably have said more than you can receive tonight. But behind all of this, there is a desire to be grasped again by the vision that was there at the time. And, uh, we're facing that same challenge right now. Why is it that people walk away? Why is it that people don't respond? Is it because they're hostile? Is it because they are uh, indifferent? Well, some people are. A lot of hostile people are out. And there are people who are indifferent. But I also think that many 
simply don't understand. It's the problem is one of incomprehension. The language of the church has become foreign. Now, I'm going to say something that I hope you will not quote me on. And uh, Oh, it doesn't matter. What the hell? I'm having a really hard time with our new translation of the Missal. Because instead of making the language easier to understand, we've made it more difficult to understand. Now, I hope that doesn't shock anyone, but that's the experience that I'm having. Our language as church has become incomprehensible. And so, if the church is ever going to effectively be engaged and part of the modern world, we need to be aware of that. Our words don't always connect. I spend a lot of time with words. Pauline knows how many times I rewrite these documents and these texts, right? It's because words are important. Jesus calls himself, or we call him, the Word of God. But if he's incomprehensible, then we're not meeting God. We're not experiencing the fullness of meaning that is brought to us. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to quit? Are we supposed to throw in the sponge? Are we supposed to say the hell with it all? Some people have. And I'm thinking, I was ordained in 1970. In 1970, at that point where I was in Montreal, hundreds of religious priests and lay people packed it in. When I went to the seminary, I was in a class of 110 students in first year. Four years later, 11 of us were ordained. And of the 11, there's only five of us left. So we could all pack it in. We could give it all up. But then people like Pope John XXIII came along an old guy, and he says, we can't do that. We can't just throw in the sponge. And he shook up everybody in Rome when he woke up one morning and called in whatever it was, 17 cardinals who were running loose in Rome at the time. And he says, come in, I got to tell you something. And he says, you know, I think we're going to have an ecumenical council. And they thought, he's not only old, he's crazy. But basically what he was saying was, it's not the time to give up. It's not the time to throw in the sponge, because if we do, we're going to give way to despair. And if we give way to despair, that means we are being unfaithful to the gospel or to Jesus Christ. Well, that message is true today. And that's why we're trying to push and shove and do all sorts of things to try to get people ignited. Is that an English word? So that we can carry on with the mission that has been entrusted to us. Well, let me just conclude uh, with these last few remarks. We have lots of failures in the church. We see the sins and we see the worst part 
of our humanity expressed almost every day. We see it in our leadership, and we see it in ourselves. But every so often, someone comes along and throws us off. And he throws us off by the unexpected, like Pope John did. He throws us off by a remark, an attitude, or a smile. And that's what Pope Francis has been doing. Nobody expected this guy. And he is having an impact already. I have to pray for him every day that he doesn't become a prisoner of the Vatican. But that man, with his smile, has started something again. And what he hopefully has initiated is another transformation of the church for the benefit of the world that has been entrusted to us. That's what Gaudium et Spes was trying to do. Did Gaudium et Spes accomplish anything in the last 50 years? I think if we were to list all the things that this document was responsible for, we would be here for a while. I'd like to mention just two, and that'll be my closing stuff. And these two are close to home. I mentioned Bishop Bayes. He was there. And when he came back, he brought with him what he experienced, what he learned, and he shared it. And he brought to the church here in Halifax a vision. And one of the expressions of that vision, that desire to be in solidarity, that desire to be in dialogue, is enshrined in the Atlantic School of Theology. It's a unique ecumenical experience and experiment. It's the only school of its kind in Canada. And I don't want to venture beyond Canada, but I would probably guess that it's one of the few in the world. And that was because of the spirit of dialogue and solidarity. The second example is one that all of you have heard about, perhaps all of you have been involved in in one way or another, and that's development and peace. Development and peace was the way that the Canadian bishops found to give a concrete expression to what we find in this pastoral constitution on the role of the church in the modern world. And what was it that they were trying to do? They wanted to care for those in need, they want to do it collaboratively, and they want to do it by recognizing the shared humanity which makes us brothers and sisters. And behind that was the belief that if you help people in need to become human, to develop, that's what's going to bring about peace. Well, of course, in 50 years, many things come and many things go and lots of things change. And the ecumenical movement is not where it used to be 50 years ago. And development and peace has undergone some controversial 
criticisms and difficulties. And be that as it may, it remains an expression of a desire to make a better world. Last question. Will we ever catch up to the modern world? Because every time we think we're there, it moves. And I guess we probably won't catch up. But what came to mind when I asked myself this question was, you know the saying of the Lord that we must be in the world, but not of the world. I think that's how we're in the world, but not of the world. Because somehow the world keeps moving. But the mission remains, which is to bring to those around us what we ourselves have experienced. That's what we're trying to do with the new evangelization, and that's what we're trying to do in our parishes and in our communities. And so my last words are, may the Spirit set our hearts on fire and allow us to share together the Gaudium and the Spes, to share together our joy and our hope. I think that's enough. Amen. Thank you. Well, I already said that we haven't been able to catch up. So I'll only give a personal opinion because there's, you know, there's different ways, I suppose, of evaluating things. My view is that after 50 years, we are only beginning to grasp some of the value and treasure that is in Vatican II. I don't think that Vatican II has been implemented very well across the world. Oh, we changed many things. We changed the altar around. We did all of those things. But those are externals. What we haven't accomplished enough is the change of heart. And partly, I think, because we were not able to fully grasp what was behind the ecumenical gathering, the ecumenical council. I think I spent 15, 17 years of my life promoting something called ministry to priests. And this was a counseling type of program for priests. It came into being to help priests grasp what was being asked of them by Vatican II. And in those 15, 16 years, 17 years that I worked with priests, I realized that there was something blocking the reception of the message at the heart of the council. And part of that blockage was the inability to comprehend what it means to be personally converted. This is among priests. There were, con there were conditions and factors at the time that did not allow for that comprehension. Because we were trained in being priests 
as functionaries. It was about what we did. It was Pope John Paul II in all of his writings that spoke about the priest not from the perspective of what he does, but from the perspective of who he is to be. And he refers to that as the ontological. Now, that as a concept, we understood. But as an experience, we were far from that. There was a German priest, Eugene Drevermann, who wrote, I guess in, I don't know, 20 years ago, he wrote it in German, I read it in French. Big thick book called Les Fonctionnaires de Dieu. Anybody speak French here? No? Les Fonctionnaires de Dieu. That's tr literally translated means the functionaries of God. Now we all know kind of what government functionaries are like. They're good people, but they're in a box. They're in a framework. They're in a framework of time and uh, job descriptions and all kinds of external restraints. And you do what you have to do. If it's not your job, you don't do it. It's a negative definition. It's not, not all people who work for governments are like that. And not all priests are like that. But as, a, as an image, it spoke to what was happening in the lives of priests. Now, why am I saying that? It's because the priests were the ones who are standing up here. And they were the ones who were supposed to transmit the message. Now, some guys did a good job. But some other guys, they didn't really know what it was that they were supposed to do because the rule book was changed. The manual was no longer the same. Like the new translation, you know, it's changed. Then you're uncomfortable. So to go back to your point, are we, are we close to implementing the Second Vatican Council? I uh, don't think that we have accomplished our job yet. One of the things that I discovered since I started to talk about the new evangelization is th the fact that the term, the expression, the new evangelization was not invented by John Paul II, as everyone thinks. It's found in the 16 documents of Vatican II. It was presented and articulated and spoken about throughout the 16 documents 50 years ago. We're only beginning to hear about it in the last couple of years. So if that's a criteria, perhaps that's one way of seeing, or at least one way that I see an answer to your question. Someone told me the other day that they were hoping that Pope Francis would call a third Vatican Council. And when I heard that, I secretly said to myself, I hope he doesn't do that. Because we don't need a third Vatican Council. We need to implement the one we've got. Yes. And, and it's possible that that's the case. Uh, but you know, the imagery of being fed, we feed ourselves three times a day, usually and every day. You don't get fed if you only go once a year or twice a year. 
So when someone says, I'm not being fed, I said, well, that's probably true, but that's because you're not coming to eat. <laughs> you're not coming to the table. You're not coming to be part of the family. So not only are you not fed, in a sense, materially, you're not even being fed by the encounter with the rest of the family. If, if you haven't seen a brother or sister in 20 or 30 years, even though you're brothers and sisters, there isn't going to be a whole lot of connection, is there? So, of course there are people that are not being fed. So how do we feed them? What you suggested is precisely what going out and speaking to someone else and sharing what you believe and how you get fed and how you are able to draw from the Lord the strength that you need to keep going on a daily basis. That's the new evangelization. It's only new for the person who has never heard it. <laughs> it's not new for the person who already has the background and the experience and the wisdom. But that's what we're called on to do. Yeah. Well, I haven't read the book, so I can't give you an impression of the book. But from what you've said, what surfaces in me is to speak about what some authors are now calling evangelical Catholicism which I think is not just going to see what our evangelical brothers and sisters are doing and borrowing the techniques and the mechanics and the means. That's, we can do that. But what this phrase, evangelical Catholicism, means, and the guy who uses it, if any of you are interested, his name is George Weigel. He's the guy that wrote the biography, the definitive biography of John Paul II. Now, he is the one that writes about evangelical Catholicism. Google it, you'll get an article on it. Okay? And what's he saying? He's not saying, let's become evangelicals like our guys down the street. What he's saying is how the church has shifted with Vatican II, it has shifted from being the church that it was, which was the church of Christendom, where everybody was Catholic, whether you liked it or not, to evangelical Catholicism, where you become a Catholic because you have been evangelized. You have been personally brought to the Lord. You have been personally exposed to the biblical roots and origins of what it means to be disciple of Christ. And that's the new church that needs to be worked on and developed so that we can have an impact on today's modern world. So it connects with the book, I think, but I'll have to read the book. And, and that fits in with some of the things that we've been saying, at least that I've been saying for the last little while. What you're talking about is true. We sometimes, in all of our communities, mix the means, mix up the means and the end. See, the means is the fundraiser. And we get so caught up with getting the fundraiser going that we forget that the only reason we're collecting the money is so that we can get to the end, which is the mission. So in the fundraising, as you just pointed out, you need to build in the mission. It's, we have to, what was the phrase that was used? Uh, um, Father uh, James Mallon used it at our transmission conference last year. We have to move away from maintenance to mission. If we're all we're interested in is maintaining the building, what for? So that it can be empty? 
Let's maintain the building, absolutely. But let's get on with life. Let's get on with whatever it is that we need to do, which is to bring people to the Lord. Last week we introduced, or whatever it was, we introduced our new catechetical program. What's the title of it? Be My Disciples. <laughs> That's the point. Go out and make disciples, because you can't be one if you don't make them. That's what the gospel says. Make disciples. How do we do that? So the engagement that we're trying to talk about and that we're trying to get parishes to become more conscious, be an engaged parish, yeah, what for? So that you can have a nice, warm, cuddly uh, community? If you do, it's only because that's one of the side effects. That's not the purpose. It's not the goal. It's so that you will not be afraid to go out and do something for the guy that's sitting right next to you every day. That's where the mission turns out to be. Most of us are afraid to do that. So that guy has obviously worked hard and he ran into trouble and he's had, uh, but he's had some success. I think uh, perhaps the Holy Spirit is doing that. You see, what we, what we fail to recognize is that even the church in its institutional form is a human creation uh, in large part. And like so many other organizations, sometimes it has to die. And what is it that's making us come up to, to be aware of this in our area? What's the thing that's making us face the vulnerability, the weakness, the uh, poverty of our institutional church right here in Nova Scotia right now? Demographics is one of them. Demographics is one of them. But one of the, where are you going, are you going to say? Oh, maybe it's the devil. Yeah, he, missed a, he had a hand in what I'm thinking about. But what's causing us, what's causing us to experience our poverty financially is all the lawsuits that we're paying out. Now, you can have all the fundraisers in the world, but we're never going to have enough bloody fundraisers to cover up all of those. Now, that's the sinful side of the church. And what is it that, uh, you know, uh, Steve Murphy wants to talk about when uh, he wants to talk about church. Well, you're closing such and such a church, or such and such a church is being shut down. Yeah. And there's going to be more of them. So your point about the church becoming smaller on a very real level is being experienced as we shrink in our capacities because we can't keep up what we've inherited from the 1930s or 40s. The other thing that I've just been experiencing the last few, uh, the last few weeks, and uh, we announced it, I guess, yesterday, uh, are the changes that we're going to implement among the priests in the next, for the next year. It's gonna go into effect on August 1st. What was the problem? Problem is, I've run out of priests. I've run out of priests. My example I've used a few times at the office is it's like I'm trying to pull rabbits out of a hat, and I've run out of rabbits, and I don't have a hat. Now, does that mean that the problem is that we don't have enough priests? 
Maybe the problem is that we keep imagining that we should have the kind of priests and the number of priests that we used to have in 1950. Do we need all those priests? Depends what kind of church you're trying to keep going, right? Some of the guys from right here in Halifax who used to work in Peru would tell stories of how they would be two or three priests together and they would be traveling for hundreds of miles serving people everywhere. And then I was told there are some elderly people right now in our church who remember that in their lifetime where a priest came around once a month or maybe every couple of months. See, the faith doesn't depend on the structures. The structures and the faith need to be in harmony as much as possible, but it's not the structure that dictates. It's the other way around. So I think we are going to be a smaller community of believers. There's a biblical image for that. And Jesus used it. And that biblical image is that we are like the leaven in the dough. Most, if any of you do any baking of bread, you know what that is. You take something that's practically insignificant, you throw in probably a little water, and you put it into a pile of dough, or not dough, flour, and you punch it to death. And then something happens. The church is the leaven. Are we able to live with that? That's going to be the test, isn't it? Pope Francis, first week of his pontificate, says, I wish we had a poorer church. A poorer church. That wasn't talking just about money. He was talking about the attitude. He was talking about the spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Amen to that? All right, thank you very much.